Got it. Okay, now we're live. Hold on. Hold on. Let's see if I'm live now. Let's see if I'm live now. Yeah. Am I live? Yes. Okay, thank you, wifey. Okay, chat. With a horrible start to the live. Hold on. Let me make sure that I am, in fact, live once and for all. Yes, I am. All right, chat. We are here with a horrible live. I just spoke for like 15 minutes about Richardson Hitchens because I thought I was live already. Anyways, let's, uh, we can't, we can't, we're not monetized yet, so, so we don't have to give a damn about copyright. Play the intro. What's up, chat? What's up? We're back. We're not going nowhere. What's up? All right, had to have a little intro, Royce the 5'9", and the point of the song is, this song, Hip Hop from Royce the 5'9", is about bringing it back to the essence uh, of being a true MC, a true master of ceremonies, where it's about your skills, it's about dedication to your craft, and so, um, you know, with me having to, to leave the biggest channel in the sport, you know, sh shout out to Fight Hype, they're gonna be on top for maybe ever. Um, you know, I, I nothing left to do but take it back to the essence. So here we are, baby. Um, what's going on? Let's get started. We had Richardson Hitchens and Gustavo Limos. I'll start with an unpopular take right out the gate. I did not think Richardson Hitchens got a robbery. Um, let's take a look at his walkout while we're here. Why not? Let's show that we still got some video. Underrate, one of the most underrated albums ever right there. So... at the fight I was very close I was close I was front row to see Hitchens um, man might, might be the last time I was in the very front row for a while but it was front row to see Hitchens and I'm happy that I was because fights are different scored on television than they are in person and sometimes you can score a fight better on television than you can in person and sometimes vice versa depending on the fight and depending on where you're sitting so I thought that Hitchens um, I had Lemos up two rounds to one. And before you guys go crazy saying that I thought it wasn't a robbery, um, let's not forget, I wasn't sleeping on Gustavo Le Lemos. I've, I said right here. I said right here, chat. I'm getting some Brian Castaño vibes from Gustavo Lemos. He looks like him, has eyebrows like him, and has a similar build and style. Well, that turned out to be basically exactly true. He was a short fighter who cut distance very well, and when he gets you on the ropes, he throws combinations with bad intentions and throws them very well. Uh, Brian Castaño, even though 14 pounds heavier, faster hands than Gustavo Lemos. But Gustavo Lemos, pound for pound, a uh, heavier-handed guy at 140 than Castaño. So I wasn't surprised that Hitchens struggled mightily. I, that's what I suspected. If, even if you guys went back and saw my, my interview with uh, Hitchens before the fight, I was saying, do you think this guy's a Maidana? Do you think this guy's a Matisse? Do you think this guy's a Brian Castaño? And he wasn't sure. He had to find out for himself. After the fight, he said he, the guy was tough as hell, could give the champions a tough fight. So I was okay with 115, 113. 117, 111 is, you know, atrocious. It's the kind of things that makes people believe that fights are already fixed in a way for the A-side fighter to win because there's just no way it was 117, 111. But I was cool with 115, 113, and I'll explain why. I had Gustavo... Lemos, what's up, Chris Venegas? Hey, I gotta get like you, Chris. I'm, I, my man Chris got like 200,000 subscribers. I was checking out your channel. I was checking out Champ Side, KO Artist. My, of course, my guy True School Sports. And I was just saying, I was humbled. It's a humbling experience because you start to get the swag that you think those 1.7 million subscribers are your subscribers, but they weren't. They were, they were fight hypes. So. I always respected guys like Chris and, and Champside and KO and, and of course I love Brendan. I love True School. Um, but a, a, a new level of respect and humility towards those guys because um, I'm going to have to find out just how hard it is to build your own brand right straight away. So shout out to you, Chris, and everyone who's done it solo in boxing. Now, anyways, back to Richardson and, and Lemos. I had, I had Lemos up two to one. 
Then in the middle rounds from like four to eight, uh, Hitchens was able to make him go long stretches in the middle of the ring without getting his offense off. He could only get it off on the ropes. And the reason why I said this fight was different to score up close was on television, when you see when you see Hitchens getting bullied into the ropes and combinations are flying and he's ducking and dodging everywhere, it doesn't look good. But it, up close in person, I could see that more times than not, he was effective defensively enough to make Lemos hit the shoulders, hit the chest, ro roll the shot, not always catching him clean. Now, don't get me wrong, Lemos buckled Hitchens a number of times with a looping right hand over and over again. Um, you know, close to almost a half dozen times he did it. But Hitchens was able to knock his head up all the time with the jab. Early on, he wouldn't throw the straight right hand. Because, and, and that was the one punch he lacked in this fight that could have made it easier on him was the straight right hand. But he didn't trust his distance control. Some, he maybe was a little bit worried. I shoot the right hand. He's going to get underneath it. And now he's going to get busy in his wheelhouse where he wants to get busy at. So, so, But Hitchens did adjust by actually holding his own in the middle rounds on the inside. He landed some hard left hooks, a couple of beautiful right uppercuts. And when he landed on Lemos, he snapped his head around nasty, knocked the sweat off. And Hitchens, this is a problem for him. He must really not punch very hard. And that's not surprising anyone. Seven knockouts in 18 fights. But ringside, he was so fast and sharp when he would get off and land, it looks like it should hurt. You know, you hear the snap, the boom, you hear it, and the guy's head goes up, sweat knocked off. But never really much of a reaction from the legs of Lemos. He never really was hurt by Hitchens. And that's a problem for Hitchens because he hit him with his best punches and didn't do much. Um, but I thought he did enough to win. I thought he did enough to win because in the center of the ring, he made Lemos have to go one minute, one minute and a half, two minutes without getting off offense. And then when he did get him on the ropes in some rounds, Hitchens was doing better defensively than maybe it looked like on TV. So I, I thought he pulled it out. But the problem for Richardson is he's a good fighter, but he's he's. He's, uh, you know, maybe at best the fifth best fighter at 140 pounds. He's in maybe the deepest division. All those star lightweights moved up to 140. And he's an underdog, whether it's Cruz, whether it's Matias, whether it's Devin, whether it's Tio. He's not a puncher, a potential knockout artist like Isak Cruz and Matias. And he's a good boxer, but not as good a boxer as Devin Haney. Devin Haney has more... Um, more sophistication, more tools in his belt, in his arsenal on both offense and defense than Richardson Hitchens, and he can match his speed and length, and he hits a little bit harder, as evidenced by the right hand that dropped pro grade um, last December. He has a heavier right hand, um, and he's better at getting it off. So Hitchens is good, but he's an underdog against the top four. Tiafimo, now that's the toughest style matchup. Uh, let me get my hair right. I'm sorry, Chad. But Tiafimo is... Um, Tiafimo is might be the toughest fight, um, might have the hardest time with Hitchens because Tiafimo struggles with boxers. He doesn't struggle with guys that come forward and let him be a counterpuncher. He struggles with length and he struggles with guys that keep it on the outside and Hitchens is good at that. But despite that, Lopez with his talent and power and he's still slick even though he doesn't pick his hands up and cut distance well, which is what he'd have to do with Hitchens. He could potentially get upset by Hitchens, but he'd still be the favorite. Um, and after the fight, everybody was giving Hitchens shit for not wanting to, to go ahead with the Matias fight next. And, and this is why it's important that, that I keep covering fights in person and never just talk about them at home because um, you'll be quicker to dismiss fighters and, and kind of – you don't have that empathy, which I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being a, a pussy by saying that. I just mean – it's, it's different when you cover these guys and have to look them in the eye. Um, so that being said, I actually understand where he's coming from. And he made a fair point. He's 18-0. and 0, um, And Devin, Devin Haney, when he fought Cambosa, is right around 30 fights. Um, so he, he made a fair point when he said guys like Haney got JoJo, Gamboa, Linares. They got, he got to get ready with some intermediate level fights before you fight for the champion. But he just had Zepeda. Now he's had Lemos, so he's saying he wants one more of those before he gets ready. He's going to be an underdog when it happens to Matias, but I don't count him out against Matias. And I respect his honesty for saying he doesn't want it next. And he makes another fair point that 
someone like Devin Haney wouldn't have to do the 10 pound rehydration clause to fight Matias. He's a WBC champion. Since it's a unification, he doesn't have to do that. So I understand where Richardson's come from, but the fans are dragging him for that. And, and that's, that's their prerogative. So yeah, solid performance. If Lemos would have got the decision, I wouldn't have complained about it, but I, I did think Hitchens deserved the 115, 113 card. Mm. Still got some growing to do, but but there you go. Um, did people leave when Hitchens was holding, or did they leave after Pacheco? A lot of people, a decent, not a lot, a decent amount of people did leave um, after the Pacheco fight, but there's still some sick around. Oscar De La Sober said, how was the atmosphere in that venue? Okay, good question. Let me talk about that. There's so much. I know we got to talk about Benavides. We got to talk about Haney and Ryan two weeks out and the rest of the card. But since you asked, Oscar De La Sober. So the 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 one take, I felt bad for Eddie Hearn. I felt bad. Um, and I felt bad for Richardson Hitchens. So because I'm going through what I'm going through, right? I, I have my... I, I have my uh, negativity, my my bitterness. You know, I'm I'm bummed out that I'm I'm leaving the biggest site. So I'm kind of in tune with Eddie and Richardson's, you know, maybe resentment, maybe bitterness a little bit. And in today's social media era, we're so quick to weaponize when people show us anything other than being perfect. Basically, when people are open enough to say, "Hey, I'm jealous." Hey, I'm hating on this. Hey, whatever, whatever negative emotion comes up other than trying to always accentuate the positive on social media. You know, we've lost a lot of civility through social media. We bully people when they when they're down and out. We kick them when they're down. Right. So when I saw Richardson Hitchens talking about Devin Haney and going off, I could feel his envy. And I don't mean that as a diss. I want to make a deeper point about we don't let people be human anymore. Of course he's envy. I I get envious, you know. I that doesn't mean I condemn that doesn't mean at the end of the day I think it's right. That doesn't that's not what I'll stand on. I'm not going to stay on that emotion forever, but those feelings they come up. And and you know, I've been envious of people more successful and, and it happens. You so what what I saw someone do an edit with the Mad Rapper, which was hilarious from the Life After Death album. They took my interview and they edited um, I'm Shay from New Rochelle. Why are you so mad? And that it was hilarious. But, but the thing is, put yourself in his shoes. Like you've boxed since you were a little boy too. You've, um, you've, you've worked your ass off too. You're pretty damn good too, right? You've done well in the amateurs. You're an undefeated professional, but your, your peers who are almost the same age as you are making millions of dollars. They're accomplishing their dreams. They're getting famous. They're, they're getting belts. Of course you're envious. That's what you want. And I uh, and I feel you, Richardson. And to me, it's there's it's nothing wrong with it as long as you don't eat it up and you don't let it stop you from moving forward and being the best you. But I, honestly, unlike everyone else making fun of him for it, I empathized. Now, I make that point because someone asked how was the atmosphere in there. It goes hand in hand with me talking about Richardson. I'm going to include Eddie Hearn. The atmosphere was sad, right? In terms of it, it, it wasn't even as lively because it's a 2,500 seat arena in Las Vegas. Nothing wrong with that, right? But the Fontaine Blue, even though it's a new swanky casino, it's on the hood side of the strip. Everything before the win, everything before the win, basically, like uh, Circus Circus. My mother used to work at the Sahara. Um, all those hotels, that that's the more hood side of the strip. Once you get to the win and beyond and you get to Caesars Palace and the Mirage and the MGM Resorts and Cosmopolitan, then you're in the nice new luxurious part of the Las Vegas strip. And the atmosphere, it's not that it was a 2500 seat arena, it's that it's at that part of the strip and the uh it, it wasn't lively like a twenty five hundred dollar or twenty five hundred seat arena like the cosmopolitan which has hosted plenty of title fights like the virgin hotel which used to be the hard rock hotel which has hosted plenty of fights even the palms casino has hosted title fights plenty of them and it doesn't have that vibe this was kind of sad it was half empty and to, to tie eddie into it you know he certainly didn't tell me that eddie does a great job of keeping his head up and still being charming and and doing his british banter but one thing i felt bad about i was looking at eddie and i i thought to myself i feel i feel for him 
This isn't where he thought he was going to be in 2024, five or six years after he launched with DAZN with a billion dollar budget. He thought he was going to do the William Randolph Hearst. You know, uh, he, you go to the guy's desk where he works, you plop down twice as much money as his salary and you say, you work for me now. I, basically, he believed that was going to happen. And so within a year or two's time, he's gone from Canelo Alvarez at T-Mobile, Devin Haney um, fighting at sold out San Francisco, fighting in the MGM, you know, against JoJo. It was it was half empty, but still it was Devin Haney, one of the next great American fighters with the WBC title at the MGM. It was Canelo Alvarez at T-Mobile. And now he's at the Fontaine Blue with Richardson Hitchens and Diego Pacheco, who they would kill me. This would be tough to say to them if they were here now. But as of now, they look like more B-plus fighters than they do A-plus fighters. They look like good fighters who might become champion, but not great fighters who can be great, you know, foundational pieces for Hearn to make big fights in America. And so I felt for him a little bit there. I felt for Richardson, um, for both of them. They both have good things coming to them, Richardson and Eddie. I mean, Eddie's rich and... Um, and keeps his head up, and Richardson's undefeated, and he's going to fight for a world title, and he may very well beat Matias um, if, if he fights Matias. He may, he may beat Tiafimo. He'll be an underdog against both, but it may happen. But that was my honest sentiment when you ask, how was the vibe inside the arena? I remember Eddie, he started the week by saying, we're at the Fontainebleau. I think this is, I think this is really, I'm not even, I don't even have the heart to do it, Eddie, right now. But basically, he said, I think this is a, a better venue than MGM. And I thought to myself, you don't, like, you can't really believe that. You're, you're telling yourself that to keep things positive. And so then when I interviewed Eddie, and when he said, Devin Haney's going to vacate, he's going to get stripped, right? Because Richardson Hitchens is going to fight Sandor Martin for the vacant WBC. I told him in the interview, uh, Eddie, I don't know about, you know, Eddie, don't you think the WBC would just say, hey, champ, we just want 3% of whatever you got going on. You don't have to fight Sandor Martin. And basically, Eddie was trying to convince himself that the WBC would strip Devin for Hitchens. They're in this to make money. You tell me, chat, what makes more money? 3% against Devin Haney against Tio or Matias. Devin Haney against anybody. Or Richardson Hitchens versus Sandor Martin. You know, so I looked at that and I was like, Eddie, you know better. But whatever the feeling is, you're so upset that Devin has, that Devin acquiesced to Oscar. See, Devin Haney let let uh, Devin and Bill were cool with Oscar shading Eddie Hearn and putting him all the way at the end of the stage. And now Eddie revealed to us he's not even a part of the promotion, really. He's he's stepping out of it. Does, he, he says the zone wanted him to keep he, he promoting it, but Eddie's got some dignity and doesn't probably if he's not what you, you don't want to be where you're not wanted. So when he said that he thinks Haney will get stripped when you and I both know that ain't happening, I said he's upset because. Haney, Haney and Bill, Devin and Bill let him go. Now, by the next day, they took a picture. They patched it up. Eddie corrected himself. Eddie corrected himself saying he's not vacating. Yeah, he's not vacating. That, that was wishful thinking. Um, Oscar's getting Eddie back because Oscar feels like the Canelo, let's call it the Canelo coup. He feels like Eddie helped coup Canelo. From what I, was, from what I heard over the years, Eddie had the paperwork. He had the, the paperwork, the the that DAZN had that showed Canelo's contract. And there were certain things in it Canelo wasn't quite privy to. So once he revealed the details of that contract, Canelo got pissed with Oscar, and eventually Eddie became Canelo's promoter because, because Eddie was in the good graces of DAZN. He was their guy. Now maybe he's beginning to lose that, that ace promoter in America to Oscar. Maybe DAZN is beginning to, to, to align more of their assets with Oscar the American promoter in America who has some good American talent like Virgil Ortiz and Ryan Garcia and who has an established record of making big, big pay-per-views in America. So to answer your question, there you go. There you go. Um, that is the vibe in the arena that night. Um, and I say that, you know, with love and respect for all everyone involved, but that, that was the vibe. It was kind of sad. So, um, Let's see. Um, what's up, boxing analyst? What's up, True School Sports? Um, uh, what's up, Johnny Cordojo? 
What's up, everybody? Um, tell <laughs> Caleb said, damn, you think Eddie is mad at Team Haney? I think he was, and then they patched it up. That's I think, Caleb, I think that's what that photo was about, was, you know, it was probably friendly. It didn't get heated or anything, but Devin's probably like, you're tripping. Why are you saying I'm straight vacating? He's like, oh, well, I thought, I thought you were. You know, I thought you would because you don't want to fight Sandor Martin and all, you know, and they passed it up. They're good. But Eddie's human. You know, he had to have not liked being pushed all the way to the side with Oscar. And I, if I know human nature, he probably looked at Devin and Bill and was like, hey, you guys can't look out for me a little bit. You know, I, I promoted a lot of fights, made you money, maybe more money than the fights were really drawing at that point early on. But but whatever. It's all good. Um, I do. Someone asked, do you see Haney stopping Ryan? I do. I do actually think Haney um, can and will stop Ryan. I do. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But, yeah, I do think Haney will stop Ryan. I think Haney's going to get to number one pound for pound at some point. I've said that uh, since he was a teenager, since early covering him in his career. I don't say that because I'm biased. There is a little bias in that you want to be the one, the first one to call it, but I'm not calling it because of my, I genuinely think that the, I, I, I kind of wanted to see it happen. So I could say I was the first one to say it. I'm being honest, but, uh, but yeah. Um, so, so let's move on. Let's see. Do we go, we'll go to Haney Garcia. You guys got me talking about Haney Garcia. So let's go to Haney Garcia. So I made a quick little edit and people trashed me because People trash me because they go, how could you compare a heavy bag to an actual opponent? Well, maybe April 20th, we get to see this triple right hand actually thrown against an opponent. So I, I feel like Devin has a great jab, great jab to the body. He could touch the body. I, I feel like he might he might set up this right hand later in the fight because Ryan, Ryan uses his jab early in the fight. For the first round or two, he'll use his jab and then he'll get away from it. And even Oscar Duarte, who has short arms and isn't like a counter puncher, he was able to get very close to Ryan's chin. Ryan would pull straight back past the jab to get away from the counter right hand shooting over the top of his jab. And I don't think he's going to be able to get away from it from Devin as the fight progresses. So I felt like there were shades of, of Floyd Mayweather's triple right hand here. Let's check it out. He keeps getting pounded like he is right now. And here we're going to see the way he just devastates Endo. That right started it all. He measures him, and then that is a right that starts him on his way down. And once again, that right flushed him. I mean, if you see it, it's very similar, the, the form. So that's what it reminded me of right away. Like the first time I saw Devin post that clip, I, I my mind immediately went to Philip Endo, 2003, def Floyd defending the lightweight title and knocked him out with a series of right hands. Uh, people like, I, I don't think Devin is quite Floyd Mayweather. I think Devin's going to make the Hall of Fame. I think he's going to get to number one pound for pound. But I do think uh, Floyd's talent is just other was otherworldly even compared to great talents even to compare to great talents like terrence and andre ward and devin and, and and shakur and others but floyd's reflexes and hand and foot speed were from another dimension that only existed with guys like a young ali roy jones maybe hector camacho in terms of foot and hand speed but camacho didn't have floyd's reflexes and defensive prowess but but I say all that, I, I only say that because I already know everyone's going to jump down my throat for comparing Devin Haney to Floyd Mayweather, who is a top 10, top 5 fighter that ever lived. But I've always thought that Devin is going to be the next closest thing in the near future to Floyd. And he, he, he has instincts and he's smart like Floyd was. He has long arms like Floyd did. He's hard to hit. And I, I think there's, he's got a little bit of, and, and he's posted this in years past. I actually told him before too. He's got a little bit of Kobe Bryant to Michael Jordan. They're not as similar as Kobe and Michael were. I mean, Kobe and Michael were really similar. Uh, Devin's got similarities to Floyd, but not quite like that. Um, but there is a little bit of that 
Kobe Bryant to Michael Jordan, Devin really studied this man and knew this man and got mentored by this man. I don't know how they are right now. Bill and Floyd don't seem to be getting along, obviously, but yeah. So that's why I had to show that clip is it immediately reminded me of his right hand and I'm calling it now. I think he can end the fight with that punch. And Devin's got to be very careful early in this fight because I think Ryan is going to come out crazy in the first two rounds like he did against Tank. Um, and unlike, unlike Tank, Devin doesn't have that quick eraser because Ryan won round one. He was having a good round two. And then Tank dipped down some shots, southpaw straight left hand brick and sat, him, sat his ass down, sat him down. I don't know. Um, part of me wouldn't be surprised if Devin can sit him down with the right hand because maybe he can, you know, get Ryan to run into it. Maybe Ryan won't have the respect early in the fight. But but it, Devin hasn't shown the ability to just offset someone like Ryan getting off to a fast start with that, with just one punch. Because basically after, after that straight left hand in round two, Ryan was tamed. The lion went back into the cage. And he, he fought with Tank another couple of rounds, had a moment here and there, but the fight was really over after that first straight left hand. He, he took a lot of Ryan's guts from him. He, he, took, he took a lot of his spirit out of him in that straight left hand um, and then finished him with the body shot. Now, Ryan is going to actually be strong. He wasn't strong for Tank. He's going to be strong for this fight, but he doesn't have... What they oh you guys know what they say about undefeated fighters something that's dangerous about them is they don't know how to lose and Ryan knows how to lose now so in a way it's like whatever physical advantages he's gonna have at 140 versus being drained at 36 for tank it may very well be offset by the mental factor of having having quit in a fight before having lost by knockout on that stage um, usually that that hurts a guy more than it helps them so and then not to mention all the illuminati stuff and all which i'm not mad at like you, you know i i believe in the illuminati i think i actually i've been i've been pretty i i actually suspected like ryan was partying substances stuff like that um where's the where's the original tweet from from when this was all kicking off um oh here's me when i We'll look at this video again in a minute when I asked Canelo about Benavidez and everybody thought it was funny. But where was that? I, I knew. So when everybody was pushing full steam ahead, like, oh, yeah, I can't wait for the fight. I can't wait for the fight. I can't wait for the fight. I. Where is it at? Where is it at? I questioned. I. I just looking for it. My, my sorry guys, I'm trying to find this damn thing. Here, I'll search my own damn search my own damn Twitter for it. Ah. Uh, I noticed that Ryan's voice had changed. And here it was. Here's the tweet. So I said this was February 27th. So this is before we even got to March. And this is when everybody was just like gung ho, Haney Garcia, Haney Garcia, and my I was I, I always said on my lives that Ryan shouldn't fight Devin because he can't win because Devin is just improving and getting better and better and working towards his peak, and Ryan is in the middle of a rebuild, in the beginning of a rebuild with Derek James, like Eddie Reynoso took Oscar Valdez. And he got dropped by Blue Nose Lopez, you know, a, a, a not a not a real world level fighter, a good, you know, solid fighter, good, tough customer, but not a real world champion level fighter. He dropped Oscar Valdez. Then Valdez looked OK in his next fight. But then in that third fight against Miguel Burchell, everything clicked that Reynoso and Oscar had been working on. This is just the second fight for Derek James and Ryan. And I think Ryan's mechanics have actually regressed since he's left Eddie Reynoso from Joe Goose. A lot of that wasn't Derek James's fault. I think his mechanics regressed and he fell back into some poor habits under Goose and, and in, into the first fight with Derek James too because that back shoulder roll, it reared its ugly head again. That wasn't something Ryan had done in like half a decade since he would spar Roley, since he fought Jason Velez on ESPN, but it reared its ugly head again. And Reynoso, the, the best Ryan we may ever see, was against Luke Campbell with Reynoso, but he um, 
he shunned them and all that. But anyways, to get back to this point for a moment here, I said, does anyone else notice that Ryan Garcia's voice has changed? He's had a hoarse throat for a few weeks now. And what that was me was referencing, it's just so hard, guys. Like, I, I'm not one of these, I'm not, I'm, maybe, I, I'm not someone who only talks about the sport here. I see these people in real life. So as a man, don't say anything here that I'm not comfortable saying as if they were right here. And I'm not about to go on Twitter and say, Ryan, I think might be partying. Maybe he's cocaine, alcohol, I don't know. But but what I did put out there was, does anyone else notice his voice? Because that's one thing that's indisputable. Drugs or substance abuse, that's speculation. I really don't know. I'm only speculating. But the voice definitely changed. And then Devin, weeks later after that tweet said, you know, stop the coke, it's fucking up your voice and everything. So I never thought Ryan had a chance to win this fight. And, I, I, and that's despite his immense natural physical talent. You can't teach height. You can't teach power. You can't teach speed. He has all three of those things. And, you know, we know decorated amateur and everything. But he, um, he isn't getting better. I think he's gotten worse since the Luke Campbell fight. And, and couple that with maybe or maybe not partying and lifestyle decisions. Or he's admitted to drinking and smoking weed even during this camp. I like, I like to smoke weed too, but it's, it's not conducive to helping you win a championship level fight. Now, if Ryan, if Ryan knocks Devin out despite all of this, props to him. And he is a, he's a fucking superstar. But this isn't, that's not logically what's going to play out here. The, Devin Haney's going to win. It's a question of how and when. Does he go 12? Because if he goes 12, Tank Davis is going to be tweeting and laughing up a storm and his fan base and PBC will be right alongside him doing it. And it'll, it could hurt Devin's stock, actually. Um, I mean, unless it's just a real beating and, and Ryan is just holding up to it. But I don't know if Ryan's wired like that. I don't know if he's wired to take a shellacking round after round after round um, like Adrian Broner did to Maidana, you know, like, 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 like Valdez did a little bit with Stevenson. Well, not nearly as violent a beat down, but getting picked apart round after round. I don't know how much Ryan will suffer through that. If he really feels the fight has gotten away and he has no answers. Um, his best bet is the catch and shoot left hook. You know, he's in the fight. If he could take Haney's power and he could walk through some shots if he could walk through some shots and punch at the same time Haney's punching and time him, and he's got the speed to make it happen, he could hurt Devin with the left hook and, and knock him out, shock the world. But um, I just think Devin's skill set is too sophisticated for him. Uh, and yeah, I just think that Devin's going to pick him apart. And then at that point, it's going to be on Devin to put his foot on the pedal. Uh, it felt like he could have stopped Regis Progre. Every time he really sat down on a right hand, he hurt him. And he dropped him once, but he didn't get him out of there. And Devin Haney does, to critique him, he does do something that a lot of fighters in today's game do, which is not really throw combinations. And um, it, I think Floyd had something to do with that stylistically. Floyd and showing the shoulder roll, and with Floyd's pull right hand, it's... Like a lot of guys that study Floyd, like it takes the jab away. And, and if you're dealing with someone who studied Floyd's style, they're a good counter puncher. And so the combinations since, since Floyd became the best fighter in the sport, they kind of just started to go down. Pacquiao still threw him. I don't even know if it's fair to include Floyd. That wasn't a diss in any way. I'm actually giving him credit that he's altered the style a little bit. Although on the negative side, you know, part of his style also did – Tell God, late in his career, not Pretty Boy Floyd, not Pretty Boy Floyd against Arturo Gatti and Diego Corrales, but late in his career, he didn't really throw combinations. I think like the last time he was throwing combinations was the first Maidana fight, the Cotto fight. So yeah, even when he was old, he did throw combinations. Let's just leave Floyd out of it. Devin doesn't throw a lot of combinations and he, he's got such good hand speed and good form, you know, if he, if he hurts Ryan and can't get him out of there with a single shot or two shots, he'd love to see him do the Sugar Ray Leonard, do the, the Oscar De La Hoya, step on it and throw some combinations. Um, and then my boy Brendan Taylor, True School, even thinks that a disqualification is in play. And that's not crazy because Ryan said if Devin clinches him, he's going to break his arm. 
and he's going to do some dirty shit. So even Ryan losing this fight by DQ is in play. I do think he's going to come out like a wild man. And maybe Devin could shock us and drop him early like Tank did and, and show the power is real at 140 and, and drop him early. But I think Devin's going to have to take his time and pick him apart early before he could really start lighting him up with right hands. And, and again, I'll say it. I think the fight could, could end on this punch. I think the fight could end on this punch, this right hand that he's working on. I suspect that's the fight, that's the punch he's working on to close the show, to clean it up. And he won't be looking, for, he may not be looking for it early, he may. If, if Ryan is being wild, like I think he might, might run him into it early. But um, yeah, I, I got Haney winning that fight. If Ryan proves me wrong, all the credit in the world to him. I didn't knock him on, on the Illuminati stuff. I, I talked about, I actually didn't knock him on any of that. A lot of people are, um, but I didn't. Um, Anyways, that's another topic for another day. Let's talk, let's talk David Benavidez for a minute here. Um, as you guys know, because I know it's basically all my hardcore and we've got 35 people in here. Not bad for a first live. You guys know, what's up, Ernie V? Ernie said, Zatel, great to see you, brother. Uh, Gabba Harrow said, Ryan surviving the 12 will be a win. Um, still the same thing, said, I still say Ryan will bless us with a nomos. Uh, Money Mike says if he can get on the inside, he has a chance. Yeah, he's gonna have to, his chin's gonna have to be correct. Um, and Derek James is one of the best at the catch and shoots. I don't love that Derek James doesn't really teach his fighters head movement like like a Eddie Reynoso does. I don't think that's good. I think it caught it, it wasn't good for Spence. I don't think it was a coincidence that Jermel Charlo leaned heavily into Joan Guzman to, to become undisputed and win the rematch and improve his head movement and his combinations while moving off the ropes i think that was joan guzman but one thing derrick james is very good at is making you work your lead hand more consistently which ryan doesn't do after the first round or two and he's great at the catch and shoot he's great at catch catch shoot he's great at that that's what made errol spence a three-time champ at welterweight and if ryan he's gonna have to catch catch some of them are gonna get get through the high guard but if he can walk through some catch and shoot and get off the hook at mid to close range yeah he'll, he, he could make something happen in this fight but i just think he's going to be getting picked apart you could actually watch their last amateur fight the sixth one they had and devin's jab to the body was setting up the right hand over the top and i see that happening in this fight too so um but let's what's up tv boxeo shout out to you and your son chris venegas um let's let's talk benavides now so as you guys know I love David Benavides. I, I, I love that he's that rare blend of a top 10 pound for pound talent and a top 10 exciting fighter, exciting style in boxing. Those, those don't always go hand in hand, but he's one of the fighters that do, like Sugar Shane Mosley, like Holyfield, like Eric El Terrible Morales, Roberto Duran. These are guys that are not only top 10 elite, but top 10 exciting. And so that's what I love about David Benavides. And I love that I love his story that he was at one time just like us, you know, a boxing hardcore. He was, uh, you know, he was fat and loved watching boxing. And then that, that little fat boy at 14, 15 years old was going heads up with Gennady Golovkin and Kelly Pavlik and became the youngest super middleweight champion in boxing history. So I love David Benavidez. So I say it with love that I'm concerned. He's I I hounded Canelo for years. Here, let, let let's let's recap. Let's recap how often I would bother uh, Canelo about fighting David Benavidez. We know you have talked about the Bevel rematch next, but you've also said you hope Ramirez wins that fight. And if Ramirez wins that fight, you, you don't want to fight him because you're both Mexican. So at 68, you know the best fight looks like you and Benavidez. He's born in America. He's half Ecuadorian. So does he count as Mexican or or that fight can happen? If, if uh, you know, in the future, I don't know. Anything can happen. <laughs> so, don't get me wrong. I've, I, I've, I've, you know, championed David's cause in the sport. I believe in him. I think he's, I think he's great for boxing. So, I've hounded, I've hounded Canelo over the last four years about fighting David because I know it's a great fight. Um, and I know it's great for boxing, and it's a fight that I feel like if they were fighting next month in May. I would pick David to win, but I'm concerned about him now. You got a great fighter in Canelo Alvarez. You got a great champion 
who's starting to age. Who, you have a great aging champion in Canelo Alvarez who's into his 30s, well into his 30s now. And he's not jumping at this fight the world wants to see him take. The, a fight that would be the biggest fight in boxing. A fight that would sell out where the Raiders play at Allegiant Stadium. And it's almost as if you, it looks like he's, he's looking for an edge. He's doing what Sugar Ray Leonard did to Marvin Hagler in 87. Let him fight Mugabe first. Let some of the tread on that tires come. Let him, let him wear down a little bit. Then I'll take the fight when it's smart. And I feel like that's what's happening now with Canelo and Benavidez. I feel like if they were fighting next month, really like they should be, first of all, Benavidez wouldn't be out drinking. This is what happens. This happened to Errol Spence when he didn't get the And that's on Spence because Crawford, just like him, wasn't getting the fight he needed and wanted. But Spence, it was like, by not making the Crawford fight for so long, you begin to ruin the spontaneous ascent of, of, of the athlete. Forget the business for a second. The spontaneous ascent of the athlete, the merit of the sport. And... Errol began to drink more, get drunk at fights more. And if and part of me was like, it's because he should be getting ready for the summit meeting with Crawford. I feel like that with David. I, I do, do you guys really think David would have been at the Fontaine Blue drunk if he was getting ready for Canelo Alvarez in four weeks? No. So that's not an excuse. That's on him, right? But so now Canelo, this, this great aging champion, he's got his edge. He sees the edge he needs now. The little bit of the little something to tip his way when he's smaller and older so that he could beat this monstrous young lion. So what's he get? First of all, David is going up to 75. And even though David has said he'll fight Better Be Ever Bevel, the business doesn't line up. They have a rematch clause, and Better Be Ever Bevel. I think Better Be had fought once or twice on PBC years ago, almost a decade ago. Bevel has never, I don't know if he's ever been on PBC. He fought on Showtime on some Showbox cards, but I don't know if he's ever been on PBC. So, the end they're getting money in Saudi, and David explained he can't fight in Saudi due to his contract, due to the people he's lined up with, with PBC who are trying to make the big fights happen in America. Shout out to them for that. Um, but, shout out to them for making the big fights in America. But it would suck that that would hold him back from fighting the winner of Better Be Evan Beevil, which would be amazing, which is kind of really what I want from him since he's going to 75. I feel like going back down to 68 is the trap that Canelo wants for him. And they offered him the David Morrell fight at 68. Part of me wonders, was that a fight offered to him, meant to be turned down to get him to 75, to appease Canelo as they match him? with a Eddie Reynoso managed fighter in Gavazdik. You want me to fight Benavides? Make him go up to 75 and then suck back down to 68. You know, give me some A-side treatment here. But at the end of the day, that may not even be true, and it's Benavides who turned down the Morrell fight. I agree with him for turning down the Morrell fight. Not to protect him. I don't believe in this over-marination bullshit that's gone on in boxing the last decade plus. Um, I don't, I don't want to see Benavides and Morrell fight five years from now. I want to see him fight two years from now when Morrell isn't just 9 and 0. When Morrell's. Who's calling me? Sorry. When Morrell's not just 9 and 0. When Morrell's really done something. When, when that fight could be um, the biggest, you know, Mexican, Mexican American versus Cuban fight, fighter ever. You know, it could be a real pay per view. Not right now, it's a, it's a great fight. It's the best fight at 168 that could be made besides Canelo and Benavides, but it's just not time yet. So I understand him saying, no, I'm good at Morrell, but no other option at 68. The other options at 75, that means he goes to 75. And it's not Roy Jones going up to heavyweight for John Ruiz and then dropping back down for Antonio Tarver, but it still can't be good. It can't be good for a guy who sometimes, like against uh, Ellis or uh, Romero, Alexis Angulo, looks too thin at 168 as it is. Now you're going to let his body go to the weight class it's probably been dying to go to for three, three or four years and then make him suck back down against a great body puncher. Everyone already scouts that if Canelo wins this fight against Benavides, it's knocking him out to the body and that body would be weakened by coming back down. And on top of all of that, you're getting drunk at fights now. That's the kind of stuff that makes me have to reassess the pick and go, Canelo might, might, might stop him to the body at the end of the year because I think Canelo is going to fight him at the end of the year. 
And David, he may say he won't march to the beat of Canelo's drum. He won't jump when Canelo says jump. But when they put the 20 plus million dollars in front of you or even 10, 15 million dollars in front of you, you're going to take the fight. And Canelo's going to get what he wants. That's how it works when you're the biggest name in boxing. So I'm concerned for David, man. I don't like seeing him drunk at the fights. I don't like the move up to 75 and then going back down to 68. I don't like it. And that's not me taking credit away from Canelo Alvarez. He's doing what a lot of great champions have done. Um, Ali fought Frazier the third time because he thought he was done. Sugar Ray Leonard waited until Marvin got a little bit older. Oscar put fat gloves on, on Floyd. Floyd made Canelo come down to 52. Canelo saying, it's my turn to do the fucking. So, um... I'm concerned for David Benavides on that front. I'm concerned because I think he may lose a fight later this year that he otherwise would have won in May. And if that happens, it happens. People don't want to hear excuses at the end of the day. And if Canelo can, can pull that off, it would only make him greater. It, it would be his Mayweather-Canelo moment, him being Mayweather, Canelo being David Benavides. So, yeah, as, as a guy who definitely has a lot of love for David, I was concerned seeing him drunk at the fight, and I, I'm concerned about the move up to 75 and having to suck back down to 68, which is what I think is exactly what Canelo's going to do to him. Um, and if Canelo pulls that off, I'll give him credit. He's already an all-time great. But if that fight was happening four weeks from now, I'd pick David Benavidez. If it happens in September or November at 168, after David has gone up to 75, might have to change the pick. So, um, So there you go. But what's up, Chiki and Boxing? I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I don't think Canelo is fighting Benavides without a rehydration clause, says Caleb. I don't know. Maybe. Might be, but maybe, maybe you're right. He did mention 25 extra pounds. It might be. He might pull out all the stops. Rehydration clause. Make him go to 75 and then back down. But, but David's meeting him halfway by drinking like that. And, and, be, and that's why he apologized. And a lot of people, people that are critical in boxing, people that tell it like it is in boxing, were saying, I don't see the big deal. It's his life. Let him live. Everybody gets drunk sometimes. Nah, man. No, no. Not, not when you have a fight in two months and you know you're going to be on screen. And not when you're just a little buzzed, a little tipsy, but, but, but you're drunk. And it wasn't a good look. So David was in his right mind when he apologized for it. And I, I disagree with the people who are kind of enabling it a little bit. It's, it's not about... Everyone does get drunk sometimes, but not when the, the biggest fight in boxing is, is still within your grasp and you have a pay-per-view fight in two months and all, and, and the, you know, they're going to interview. So is it the end of the world? No, but it's not a good sign. It's not a good sign for David um, heading into a potential Canelo fight at the end of the year. So doesn't mean he still won't win. And, and if because, you know, youth can overcome a lot. Youth can sometimes overcome all. It can overcome the weight stipulations and everything. If he does that, amazing. But it's, uh, you know, Canelo, Canelo definitely saw that and liked what he saw. So. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Let's um who you got better be ever Bevel. Uh, oh, that's a t man. I always favored Bevel because he was younger. Um because he was, he was younger and could move around the ring um, on the back foot a little bit better than, than Better BF. I think he's harder to hit than Better BF, um, even though Better BF has that underrated footwork and skill himself. He's not just some puncher. But, but then Better BF, he's began to show me a little bit of that, that extra. Like, he, he, it's not that I'm falling in love with the knockout, but Bevel is content just doing enough to win. And Better BF, he really, he really always exhausts his skill set and tries to get you out of there, which tells me he wants it a little bit more than Bivol. Not that Bivol doesn't want it. He definitely does. He's definitely tough, a uh, tough Russian guy, kid, but um, I don't know, man. It's tough. Based on their last couple performances, I thought against Craig Richards over there in, in the UK, I thought Better BF had looked better since uh in their last fight or two but i don't know that's a 50 50 fight we'll see in june um i always favored bevel and now I'm, i might be favoring better bf because he just seems to to have a little bit more in his gear 
He could t- he can go to fifth and sixth gear, and Bevel tops out at third and fourth. But we'll see. We'll see. Youth and superior jab and footwork. It's not as sexy as stalking knockout power, but it often wins fights more than stalking knockout. So maybe Bevel it is after all. We'll see. We'll see in June. Can't wait. I, I-, I got to break down some tape and really give that its own day to, to really get into it. So, um, uh, Caleb said, Sean, you must know something we don't because Canelo hasn't shown any indication that he wants to fight Benavidez talking about 150 million from Saudi. I know he's saying that, but you know, things are starting to fold in his favor. He sees David out drunk. He get, he's going to get him up to 75. That's an advantage physically making him go to 75 back to 68. I don't think it's a coincidence it's a Reynoso-managed guy fighting him at 75. I, I think – I just think Canelo is is plotting by – with you know, and and the $150 million thing is just making the price go up. It's just letting everybody know you're going to have to really pay me absurd money to get in the ring and make the fight happen. But I've always said this. Um, shit, Canelo's right there, right? So even though everybody thinks I'm this Canelo hater because I've I've – egged him on about fighting Benavides for years, and I'll continue to do so until he does. But um, Canelo is a true champion. He's a great fighter. I don't like that he was busted for Clem Buterol. Um As great as he is, he has his flaws. He only throws about 40 punches around, except for the Golovkin rematch and that run from Golovkin. You know, he's had some fun. He tends to only throw about 40 punches around. Has some has had stamina issues. At, at, at During his peak, he didn't. He kind of overcame that with Golovkin part two and Kovalev and Plant and Saunders and all that. But um, but he's a true champion is what I'm getting at. So I don't think at the end of the day, he'll duck David Benavidez. So um, although I don't like when he says, you know, I didn't duck Golovkin, I didn't duck Lara, I didn't duck this guy. This, this is the shit we only do in boxing. And it's because boxing is different than the NFL or the NBA. But in the NFL... Pat, Tom Brady in his 20th season doesn't get to go, what do I get out of playing Patrick Mahomes? What do I get out of playing Aaron Rodgers? I'm the best. I already won six Super Bowls. I don't No, He had to take his old ass on the road to Green Bay, to New Orleans, and beat Drew Brees, beat Aaron Rodgers, and then beat young, monstrous Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl. Um, they don't do that in the NFL. In the NBA, LeBron James, 39 years old, 20th season, 21st season, whatever, Go out there and play against Giannis. Go out there and play against uh, Anthony Edwards. In boxing, it's the only sport where he's done enough. He's earned the right to blah, 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 blah. No, no, that's not really how it should work. If you're the champion and you're the best, you should have to fight the best. And the WBC, man, they, they a lot of this is on them. If they would, if they, they're never going to strip Canelo, I understand, because reasons, but... That, that's part of it. The sanctioning bodies, never stripping guys, never really forcing guys to do it is partly how a guy like Canelo gets away with it right now. So, um, But I ultimately think he'll fight David. And hit David going up to 75 and all that only helps Canelo's chances. And trust me, he's looking for an edge to beat this younger, bigger, fresher kid. For sure. He has to be. Um, as he should be. So... You can't play boxing. You're comparing the two. I know you can't play boxing, obviously. Um, yeah, and boxing is a, a different corporate infrastructure, business structure than football. But at the end of the day, it's a sport. And a big reason why – remember, T. Remember, T, once upon a time, boxing was bigger than the NFL. Boxing was way bigger than the NBA. You know what began to hurt it? It wasn't It wasn't because the sport isn't still better. It's a sport itself than the NFL and, bo- and, and the NBA. Boxing is still, when it's done correctly, the greatest sport on earth. Better than MMA, better than football, all of that. But when you begin to only treat it like a business and you allow Canelo to do stuff like he does, Floyd to do stuff like he did, Ray Leonard would do it, all you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't help things. Um that's all, that's what I'm getting at. Is if you wanna have the same kind of success and following that the NFL and NBA does, you got to treat it more like a meritocracy based on who's the best like they do. And I think, I think in in conjunction with a bunch of reasons, that's part of why boxing has receded in popularity because it doesn't, it's not structured like a sport enough. So anyways, 
Um, yeah, too much. Uh, Caleb says, T, this is why boxing is less popular than tennis and golf. Too much boxing. I think it's partly that. And a big part of why boxing began to recede was ESPN didn't talk about it because once HBO and the premium cable channels owned boxing, now ESPN doesn't have a cut. ESPN has a, had, always had a cut at the NFL, Sunday Night Football, always had a cut at the NBA, the NHL. Um, now, let, you see them covering WWE now like it's a real fucking sport because they got a cut. They have a cut. They didn't have a cut of HBO and Showtime, Boxing, TVKO. So they began to pretend it didn't exist. So part of that wasn't even boxing's fault. That was a huge reason boxing receded in popularity. But that's, again, another, another thing for another day. Um, let's talk about, we talked about Hitchens. We talked about Haney Garcia. We talked about Benavidez. Shout out to Sky Nicholson. Sky Nicholson fought um, a really good fight. She was uh, quite the change of pace from Mark Castro. Mark Castro, um, you know, undefeated young fighter, was a stellar amateur, beat guys like Keyshawn Davis. I don't think he would ever beat Keyshawn Davis in the pros. And, you know, I always want to give fighters their just due. He was a stellar amateur um, and has, an, has a style a lot of fans love, especially, especially Mexican fans. He comes forward and throws combinations. He fights at a really good pace. But his defense is, is very pedestrian, man. Like, Sky Nicholson's defense was way better. They fought back-to-back. -back. Sky Nicholson's boxing skills and, you know, she, her skills and her ranginess, her defense, her footwork were all better than Mark Castro, which, again, told me, wow, sports is really changing. I know, I know that's what everybody's saying, but, you know, I don't buy into every liberal agenda that the media pushes on us, but... Women have just gotten way better at sports, whether it's Caitlin Clark in basketball, shooting Steph Curry threes. I watched Mark Castro and Sky Nicholson back to back, and Sky Nicholson was the better fighter, and which held, to, which made sense. She was fighting for the WBC featherweight championship that Amanda Serrano vacated, and Castro was not. You know, he was still he's still climbing the ladder, and he's not a big puncher. He doesn't really have good defense. So again, stellar amateur, fun to watch, but I, I don't think he's going to ever be a threat to Abdullah Mason, Keyshawn Davis, all the burgeoning lightweights who are coming up like he is. I, I don't put him up there with them, but, uh, you know, much respect to him and all fighters. And then, um, but Sky Nicholson, she boxed really well, um, rangy, cocky, had, had very cocky, not, not like you see from a lot of Commonwealth fighters. She had the swag you're used to seeing more from American fighters. Came out to Nicki Minaj, and I think I, I think I got it on my timeline. Let's see. Um, I'm not some huge Sky Nicholson fan or anything either, but the girl fought a really good fight. She's not coming to give it a good go yet. She came with some swag and confidence that we're used to in America. Now, she's, she's been uh, calling out the legend, Amanda Serrano. Serrano, in her younger days, would have probably just eat her up on the inside because Serrano was a beast, but she's well into her 30s. She's been in a lot of wars, and for an aging fighter like Serrano, that footwork and athleticism and speed of Sky and how long she is, um, it, it could give her a lot of problems. I think that's a competitive fight, for sure. Sky Nicholson, Amanda Serrano. Now... Amanda Serrano five years ago, I'd definitely pick Amanda because Sky has shown no inside game. She does what she does very well, being rangy and kind of fighting like Billy Joe Saunders did. Um, she's very good at that, but I haven't seen her do anything on the inside, plant her feet and, and get busy on the inside. I haven't seen it. And Amanda Serrano, with the way she used to move her head coming in and cut distance aggressively, um, you know, bend into the side as she would get to the body, she wouldn't be, she, Amanda would get inside. And uh, Sky has shown us nothing to think that she could hold her own with an Amanda Serrano on the inside. But now, Amanda getting older, Sky's very athletic, very confident and young. That's a very real fight. Um, so, there you go about Sky Nicholson. Um, Marvelous Irv says, Where's the commentary been, Sean? It will be, it will be back, my friend, although I'm a little worried about it. I'm a little worried. 
it's already going to be tougher to get for your boy to get credentials with a whopping 900 subscribers. Although I have my Vegas Sports Today channel that I covered the Super Bowl and covered the Raiders with. Actually, let me plug it very quickly. This is my godsend. Thank God I wound up covering football last year and created this channel. This is my other channel, Vegas Sports Today. Um, got a lot of stuff um, with the NFL, with the Raiders. I covered the Super Bowl. You see some stuff with my homes here. It was awesome for me. Uh, a lot of you know I love the 49ers, and I got to cover the 49ers in the Super Bowl. Did some really good views. So um, this channel is going to probably have to hold me down in terms of getting credentials, the Vegas Sports, until this one grows. Please subscribe and like. I, I seriously need it. But um, but yeah. Um, so I'm worried about doing the round by rounds because I don't want them to 86 me from the fights and. Um, that's harder to do when you're on a big channel, but if you're on a small channel and they don't like you going round live, doing a round by round during their fight, you know that's that's sketchy for me. But I'm st I'm gonna definitely um, do it <laughs> for some fights. I'm gonna do it this Saturday for Jared Anderson, um, and then a lot of the stuff is gonna depend on credentialing. If they credential me to Ryan versus Devin in Brooklyn, then I'm there and I'll be there. And and as soon as the fight's done. I'm going to go live and in the arena and immediately talk with you guys about what happened. I'm going to go live that whole week in Brooklyn, in my hometown. But if they don't, then I'll stay here in the office and we'll do a live round-by-round round on Fight Night and the pay-per-view. So, so that's how that goes. By the way, um, speaking, of, speaking, of, um, speaking of Brooklyn, I, I had to get a jersey. I had to get a pick-me-up jersey. I'm going to wear this in Brooklyn if I get it, but what do you guys think, chat? Vince Carter, had to get the Vince Carter, had to get the Vince Carter. There's just so much being accomplished with this jersey. I love Vince Carter, favorite wing player ever, alongside Kobe Bryant and Tracy McGrady. They were like the big three Michael Jordan clones for, for kids like me growing up in the 2000s. And in Toronto, he was amazing. And a little bit of a patriotism, a little bit of USA. This is going to be a hot fit for 4th of July. And, and Brooklyn, the Nets... The, they were in New Jersey when they made this jersey for Vince Carter, but they're in Brooklyn now, my hometown. So USA, Vince Carter, and Brooklyn in the house. Dope jersey, I think. <sighs> Thank you, Chikian. Chikian, I love you, brother. I love Malcolm X, Box, Ernie V, Caleb, uh, Molly Mall, all of you motherfuckers, Boston's. Um, Oscar De La Soba, thank you too. Even T, but uh, no, I'm just kidding, T. Because because you roasted me about the don't play boxing. All you guys, man, all you guys, I really mean this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm I'm touched that you guys would support and show up on this raggedy ass channel that hasn't had um, videos in ten years and, and to just follow me here. Thank you guys so much, man. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I feel great about that you guys came. Thank you so much. Um, Caleb said, you got to get some interviews with the Haney's or something to grow faster. Caleb, trust me. That's the, that's why I'm, go I'm going to Texas tomorrow. I'm going to, I'm going to eat money. I'm going to lose money on this trip because I got to get this channel going. So I'm going to fly to Dallas tomorrow to get Ryan Garcia. Be on the lookout. I'll be at the workout, get interviews, workout footage, and then I'll go live right after to discuss what we saw from Ryan. Um, but... Here's the problem. I would, I would love to go see Devin. I would love to go see Shakur. As I made, I, I wish they would watch this too to, to, to know how I feel. As I began to make this pivot and transition to a dream of mine, which was to be an on-air talent, um, I wanted to do, this was, a lot of this was by design in that I knew the great on-air talents, the Stephen A's, the Skip Bayless, the Max Kellermans, the, the on and on and on, Shannon, well, Shannon, Played. Forget, forget Shannon for a minute. He's amazing, but forget him for a minute. The great journalists that really made it popping, talking, right? They first earned credibility by covering their sport in the trenches, in the field for a decade, two decades. And so I, I felt like I put that work in. I, I had covered fights ringside for like 10 years, and I felt like I earned the right to have an opinion on what I'm seeing. And once I began to gave that opinion, I felt like the fighters didn't like it um, because, to be honest, you have to be critical at times. There's just no other way around it. And then my line of questioning 
got a little bit more challenging, a little maybe tougher. Respectful always. I respect all these guys. I wish they really knew that. But my line of questioning on purpose became a little more challenging. I began to think, what's, a, what's something I can ask? Not that they don't want to be asked, not to be an asshole, not just to ask something hard to be hard, but what's a real fucking question that I'd normally be hesitant to ask or other people be hesitant to ask? Let's, let's go ahead and ask it, right? Not, not to be a dick, but because it's right. It's being true to the game. And um, I began to feel like they didn't like that a little bit. I could be speculating too much. And then, um, and yeah, I, I began, because I always used to just do interviews with views in mind. I have to ask X, Y, and Z to get the views. But as time went on, I, I wanted to challenge them. I wanted to hold them accountable because I did graduate at journalism school. And I graduated late because I was a knucklehead. I didn't graduate till I was like 30. But Journalism is supposed to be the fourth estate. Journalism, when done correctly, actually serves a purpose. It actually does serve a purpose. It holds people in power accountable. And I, I wanted to do that a little bit. It's not, it, I just wanted to keep it real more. And that began to conflict with going to all these gyms and getting all these interviews. Is it fighters, championship fighters like to have their ego stroked. And I began to not really want to do that. I wanted to be a little more straightforward. And so there began to feel like this, this fork in the road. Like you either are going to keep getting the hottest interviews and go to the gyms and get that access, or you're going to have to sacrifice some of that for being honest and sometimes being critical. And that's really what I do want to do, but I, I want to do both. I want to do both. And, and, and I haven't really seen anyone pull it off. And that, that's what I'm going to try to pull off on this channel, God willing, is there's a split in boxing media. There's the people who get the best interviews and the best quotes, but they don't really speak on boxing. And if they do, they never speak critically on the fighters. And that's no diss to them. They actually have to see these men in real life. Now, on the other side, you get your media, hard-hitting, truth-telling media guys, right? But they don't say that to their face. They don't go to the fights and, and say all those things wonderful critiques cutting stuff hard hitting stuff good stuff but it's not a coincidence that those guys don't actually cover fights it's not a coincidence chat that the guys who cover fights and get the best interviews they don't speak critical and it's not a coincidence that the guys who speak critical are not actually there in person to have to see these people up front so what i'm trying to accomplish here is find that perfect middle ground where i can still be in the field and have a relationship with fighters but that relationship it doesn't really affect my honest observations because if you're not going to be honest then why even get on the fucking mic you're wasting everybody's time and i've definitely pulled punches sometimes not even out of oh because i want to still have that access although of course that's been in my mind but it's it's I have empathy, man. I, I know the I know every fighter goes through a lot. Boxing is so hard and it takes mind, body, and soul 110% to have any success in it, usually, unless you're just an amazing talent. Um, I don't know if Roly put 110% in everything. He he just was blessed with some good genetics and could punch and took that far. But but yeah, so it's like, man, I'm not trying to to come down on you, but there's literally no point in me speaking unless I am going to be critical when it's actually time to be critical. Someone like Shakur Stevenson would probably hate that I said his fight with De Los Santos was dull. But Shakur, if you can't say a fight that set a CompuBox record for lowest punches landed isn't dull, then, then when can we ever call a fight dull? And it's okay. No one's condemning you to a lifetime of of damnation it's one boring fight floyd had boring fights ali had boring fights bernard hopkins my favorite fighter of all time had boring fights his fight with howard easton eastman was terrible it was his 20th title defense staples center showed up he had just knocked out de la hoya awful fight one of the greatest fighters of all time so and in the long run it's going to be good for the fighters man it's good it's good to have media hold you accountable and keep things honest so that's the goal with this channel let's see if we can make it happen let's see if we can get those hot interviews and get some good access but not at the cost of saying what i really think and that's going to be quite challenging so hope you guys support me on it 
And I think that's a good note to end up on. Um, did I get blackballed because of that? Not as not at all. No, I didn't get blackballed. No, and and um, I made good money at Fight Height. I'm really proud of the work I did there, and I think they're gonna reign for a long time. It was a it was an amicable split. Like you know, I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't get fired, and 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 I didn't like it, it, it. You know, parted ways, but. I learned so much from Fight Hype that I will definitely incorporate into my own channel. I already have, you know, if you look at some of my titles, I, I incorporated some of what Fight Hype did before I came to Fight Hype when I was still with Boxing Voice. But um, it's time to be a man and uh, stand on my own too, see what we can make happen. And I thank all 42 of you for joining and rocking with me. And I can't wait to do it some more. Um, we're gonna thir we're gonna do Throwback Thursdays. Look, there's nothing to lose right now. I I can't if there's no monetization so we could go crazy with copyright we could we go crazy with copyright we could just you know we we could be retards um I know I know people get mad I, come on man I, my 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 cousin who's like my sister she teaches kids that have learning disabilities they're the salt of the earth but I still like to say the word retarded it's just a fun word come on I would you know anyway we can go crazy with copyright. And so what that means is I could do something at least early in this channel that I've always wanted to do. Throwback Thursdays. What's going to be Throwback Thursdays? Come join me live on the stream. Throwback Thursdays. I'll, I'll, I'll set it up like this and this will be a fight. This will be. Here's. You know what? Breaking news. First Throwback Thursday on Sean Zatel Live is going to be De La Hoya Gotti. So you guys Another come, come rock with General me. Patton. Come rock with me. This is a random fight, but I always loved De La Hoya Gotti, and I thought I'd just start it off on one that most people don't fanboy over. This was just an awesome five-round performance by Prime Oscar De La Hoya against a fearless Arturo Gotti. So, throwback Thursday. Now, I don't got to worry about copyright. Just come rock with me, and I'm going to do a round-by-round. -round. We're going to talk about some classic fights. We'll do Leonard Hearns. We'll do Ali Frazier. Um, we could do some more recent fights. You know, you know we'll see. Um, and, and what we'll do is we'll basically do it like we do on the round by rounds, maybe not calling the action every single shot, maybe more talking over it, giving my thoughts. And and let's have some fun, man. Let's watch some old classics together. I'll pick them out every Thursday. Um, Undisputed. I'm going to have to drop some Undisputed vi videos. We got to mine some views from the video game people. So I will be dropped. I think the first Undisputed video I'm going to do is a Ryan Garcia left hook knockout compilation. I'm going to get busy on Undisputed. In my downtime, hit that record button so that all my gameplay is recorded. And I'm going to put together some Ryan Garcia left hook knockouts on Undisputed. We'll get some views off that. I'm even going to fuck around and when some video games I like. I'm going to stream some of them. I'm going to do some clickbaity thumbnail shit to get some, to get some views because we got, we got to get started here. So this is a boxing channel, but I might dabble in some of my Raiders coverage. Might, might, might see a Raiders video here or there here you're gonna see some video games starting with Undisputed which is the boxing game right now but yeah man we, we, I like video games so that's gonna be a part of the channel too not not as prevalent as boxing but let's get some of that video game money chat um so we fanboy over the Floyd fight oh absolutely well, I do too uh, you know what we might just do that it, god I, I would just feel like I'm being brutal to to my late great paisan Arturo Gatti but we maybe we'll play De La Hoya Gotti and Mayweather Gotti back to back. Actually, Boston's we're gonna do that. We're gonna do Throwback Thursday, and since one's a five round fight and one's a six round fight, it they they both come out to like one full length twelve round fight. Good idea, Boston's first Throwback Thursday. De La Hoya Gotti, Mayweather Gotti. Let's compare and contrast. Mayweather Gotti was that much more dominant by Floyd, but Oscar fought a fresher Gotti who was going for broke with his left hook. Floyd fought a Gotti that was trying to shoulder roll with Buddy McGirt. I mean, you know, Floyd was always going to just absolutely dominate the late great Arturo Gotti. But, but yeah, let's compare and contrast. Let's compare and contrast. Thursday, throwback Thursday. Let's do Mayweather Gotti and De La Hoya Gotti to kick it off. Um, Caleb said, get busy on Undisputed one time. I'm, I, Undisputed's coming, Caleb. It's coming this week. Don't worry, brother. It's coming. Um, so... So, uh, let's see. Good show, Sean. Says no narrative, none. Thank you. Aunt McQueen, what's up, brother? Thank you. Um, 
Chiquia Boxing says, you're speaking facts, Sean. Media is what grows the sport. Ant McQueen said, I agree, Sean. By the same token, I think it's pretty remarkable at the same time to influence a guy to throw far less than he typically would is brilliant. Um, constructive criticism and phrasing is different, uh, says Oscar De La Sober. Um, man, just thank you again, man. Uh, Boxing King Media said, how can I get in touch with you, bud? Followed you on X. Maybe just shoot me a DM on, on X, Boxing King Media. Thank you, brother. Shields Baumgartner, Case of Diamante. You, you, you got it. You got a Case of Diamante. I got, um, you know, Shields all day. Like, I'm just, I just side with Clarissa Shields on this. I, I, I talked to Clarissa after the fight. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I got some Clarissa. Whatever. She's a drug cheat. I don't give a fuck. She's the one did it, not me. So if she, that's how you walk around on weight all year. I'm the most disciplined fighter in the world, and I stopped. Look at the videography chat. I may, I may not, may not have two million subscribers anymore, but, but the videography is gonna be two million subscriber worthy on this raggedy ass channel. Eating meat for two years, and I temporarily still raggedy ass channel. I wasn't walking around on weight, but she can walk around on weight. She was using steroids, and it's okay because she beat okay. the case. But now you need to do your body testing and do all your stuff, but I'm not finna come down there and then you be secretly using again because you can cycle on and off. We all know that. So with Alicia, she just been hating. She wanted to be number one for a long time and she's always been number two or three or four or five or six. And I think that she just got a little taste of what it may feel like to be number one. And she just wanted to like take my place. And now she's saying all this stuff about looks. It's like, look, Alicia, I don't know where the fuck you got that I was ugly from, but God not too fond of uh cute. No. God not too fond of cute and he don't care about ugly. So it's like we get what you therefore looks don't matter. But I don't even feel like she's a better looking woman than me. So I don't know why she feel like I'm intimidated by something that God gave us all equal. Like I'm supposed to be mad because God <laughs> So okay, a lot of every like so many people don't like Clarissa Shields. I love her. I love her. And full disclosure, like she was not nice. To, to me and, and to the, plenty of people, when she came out of the Olympics with the gold medal, like I remember she wasn't easy to, 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 to interview with. She wasn't friendly. She wasn't warm or approachable. And she still has that, that Flint, Michigan, get the fuck out of here side to her for sure. She could tell someone no and get out of here in a quick, in a hurry, but like she has grown a lot as a woman. And I've seen her, she's, she's happy. I, she's genuinely happy with her success. And even though she's not like as famous as Megan Rapone or T, uh, uh, Serena Williams or Caitlin Clark, she she's as great as any of them, if not greater. And she knows that she's content in actually knowing that. I think she talks it, walks it and sells it like she sells her fights. Great. She talks good old school shit. She talk like she brings me that energy, you know, that James Tony, like not, I mean, She's not as great a trash talker as James Tony. James Tony is an amazing trash talker. She's a really good one. But she has that old school Midwest, I'll say it, you know, old school Midwest black American fighter, just that old school swag. And she backs it up every single time. No one's even come close to beating her. No one's even as close to as accomplished as her. Except Katie. Katie, by beating Chantel, is two division undisputed now. But God, man, everyone just doesn't like, not everyone, but a lot of people just don't like the girl. And they all side with Alicia. And um, I guess they, because they think Alicia is fine and they don't, they don't think Clarissa is. And everyone thinks Clarissa is too loud or too ratchet or whatever. I just don't, I, I don't view her that way. I think she's a great American athlete. Forget just boxer. Like she's, she's just a, an all time great American athlete through the Olympics, the pros, everything. And she always backs up what she has to say. And as she's gone on in her career as a woman, she's become warmer and more expressive and more approachable. And um, she even adopted her little niece. Like So anyways, um, Alicia put the knife in her is from what I could see because they were cool. And then Alicia gets busted for PEDs and she starts she starts talking a lot about Clarissa and I could beat her and see me at 147. She's never fought at 147. Why would the greatest fighter in this in the history of the sport, one of the greatest female athletes of all time, fight at a weight class she's never fought at? To you know, that that's bullshit. And and um, if they ever did fight at at a weight Clarissa could make, Clarissa would win. She's too big. 
And I'll say this for Baumgartner, though. Baumgartner has more of a professional style. She sets traps. She slows the pace down. She's a she's kind of a better counterpuncher than Clarissa, and she sets more real professional traps. Clarissa still does certain things that amateurs do, throw 10-punch combinations and just throw the punches really fast, but that's, that is maybe, that's one of her top three attributes that just makes her special is – Sometimes it's good positioning and you set up and you set the shot up and do all that. But Clarissa has this cheat code where she could just press a button and throw 10 punches super fast and the other girl can't do shit about it. So I think Clarissa would beat her. I think pound for pound, Alicia sometimes does more slowed down professional things that you see men do in 12 round, three minute fights. Clarissa still does what you see in the amateurs at times, but she's still just a better fighter. So, so yeah. Um, shout out to Clarissa. Um, boxing analyst said, okay, yeah, not totally not because of the arrogant attitude, but, but she backs it up and that doesn't, that doesn't mean just cause you back it up that people got to tolerate what they perceive as a shitty attitude. I'm not telling you to do that, but I think she's got a little bit of that, you know, that, that, that great trash talkers have. There's a little smile in there. She's funny. Some of the shit she'll say is funny, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, anyways, I'll, I'll catch you guys later. Boston's, um, no raggedy over here. Thank you, Boston's. Very nice. Uh, Unknown Samurai, what's up, brother? Good to see you, man. Said, hey, Z, congrats on the new channel. Appreciate you continuing to give us this content. What do you think is next for my man, Caleb Plant? Well, I think what's best for boxing is not what's best for Caleb Plant. I think what's best for the division and what's best for boxing is Caleb gets fed to David Morrell. Now, it's up to, it's up to his performance if he gets fed. He could upset David Morrell and expose him as a hype job and all this stuff, but David Morrell is really fucking good. Uh, he checks a lot of boxes. He punches hard. He moves a lot. can move and punch at the same time hard. Athletic, big, young, hungry um swag so i feel like what's best for the division is not what's best for caleb plant and that would be this kid david morell is only nine and oh he needs some names we all know he's the future he needs some names he needs andrade he needs plant he needs charlo those three got to get fed to him mobili too for a young guy that's got a little buzz going i think morell would beat all those guys and after beating them He'd be sitting in the kind of position where we have a new, real, burgeoning star in boxing in, in the super middleweight, light heavyweight divisions. So, but I don't think that's, that's what's best for Caleb. What's best for Caleb is getting the Jamal Charlo fight, period. Jamal Charlo, even though he's not the fighter he once was, even though he shows us a lot of bad signs outside of the ring, he's still undefeated. He's still undefeated. Undefeated, former two-division champion. If you're Caleb Plant, that's the fight. That's the fight you want. Andrade already lost. Andrade isn't undefeated. Andrade doesn't sell a fight like Charlo. It's not as sexy as a potential Charlo fight. Kayla Plant has got to get that Charlo fight. And, you know, if he's looking out for his best interest, avoid the David Morrell fight. Now, for us, for, for people who follow the sport, what's best is he gets fed to Morrell. So maybe he wouldn't be fed maybe may, maybe that's way too harsh of a word Caleb just fought a really good fight in the first five rounds against Benavides he fought a beautiful fight for five rounds against Benavides and um Benavides much more experienced than Morel maybe that five rounds is elongated to eight or nine rounds and he can hold on down the stretch and upset this kid and 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 you know expose him but I think Morel is the goods um yeah, he just has to stay away from the pitfalls. Every young fighter has to stay away from nightlife, women, all that kind of stuff. But he stays on the straight and narrow. Um, Morel's going to be around for a long time. And him and Benavides is going to be a big-ass fight one day. So, um, so Don JDM said, Sean, so happy to see you doing your own thing. Thank you, brother. Thanks for joining. Do I favor Plant over Charlo? I do. Definitely do. Um, Plant is just... He's taking care of himself so much better than Charlo has. Like Plant um, keeps his body in great shape. And uh, even though he gasses more than Charlo, he trains really hard and keeps himself in great shape. I just think uh, he's a natural super middleweight. And Jamal started at 154. He's a big-ass 54, big middleweight. 
At 68, he's just regular. And um, Plant was an amateur at 178, so he's bigger. His feet are, from what we've seen recently, his feet are fresher. He's always had better feet than Jamal. And um, and uh, he's he's a little quicker at the draw at 68. You know, he's a little quicker on the draw, especially he has a better jab. Charlo has, in his prime, had a really good jab, but he had more of a thudding jab. Caleb's is quicker, and it was excellent those first five rounds against Benavidez. I would favor Plant. I would favor Plant. He takes care of himself better. He's the natural 168, and he he uh, competed really well against Benavidez last year. So I would favor Plant. I would favor Plant. That's the fight for him. That's the fight for him. No doubt about it. Um, oh, Chiquian Boxing said, Plant is always in shape year-round, very disciplined. If I had to meet one fighter, it would definitely be Plant. Well, he's not that hard to pin down in Vegas. You, you, you'll definitely meet him at some point, Chiquian, whether it's at the weigh-ins or the fights. Um... Maybe I could find out what Jimmy's at these days. I think DLX. He trains at DLX. Let's, let's keep that between all 40 of us. Let's not ruin it for Caleb. But for my man Chikian, try to pin him down at DLX. Get you an autograph, brother. Um, Unknown Samurai, thank you, man. ASFM7799, welcome back, Sean. Happy to see you again. Happy to see you in the chat. You guys are awesome just for, for uh, coming on. Boston's, I'm out. Good to see you on stream again, Sean. Yeah, Boston's, it's dragging on at this point. So... Everyone have a great rest of the day um, and stay tuned tomorrow. I'll be live to, to, to go recap all the footage I get from Ryan Garcia's media workout tomorrow. God bless all of you. Thank you all so much for coming in. And uh, God willing, this, this thing will take off and do well in the sport. So much love, everybody. Peace. Oh, wait, let's, let's see. Oh, <laughs>